listening to episode 250A of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about your mysterious feedback on some of our recent episodes. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. So let's get right into our feedback. Our first feedback comes from uh, Johnny Lane on Twitter. Yeah, recently we did an episode, and I, I, I'm blanking on the number, but uh, we did an episode where I mentioned a Sestina that I had uh, remember hearing back in 1982 when I attended the Arkansas Governor's School, which is a kind of summer school for gifted and talented students. Um, and they had a poetry reading which had this sestina in it, and it was a sestina about writing sestinas. A sestina is a kind of poem that has a very specific form. It's based around certain key words that have to appear in a, at the ends of lines within the stanzas. And Johnny Lane on Twitter was able to find, and I mentioned that like two of the words in this Sestina were coffee and Sestina, because I remembered there being this line about, but then it comes around to coffee and you got to find a way to use that word. Um, and uh, Johnny Lane was actually able to find the exact Sestina I remembered. Actually, like three people found Sestinas that had been published that had coffee as one of the key words. I was impressed. I had no clue there would be so many. But uh, Johnny Lane found the exact one. It's by a poet named Bruce Bennett. It was published in his book, Greatest Hits, 1962 to 2000, which we'll have a link to. And it's based around the words Sestina, Coffee, Challenge, Form, It, and Promise. And so I'm going to read it for you now. Sort of a Sestina in partial fulfillment of the requirements. What, you've never written a Sestina? You gazed incredulous across your coffee. But I should think you'd take it as a challenge. I mean, with all your fancy work in form. Well, if you ever write one, let me see it. I will, I promised. Here, I've kept my promise. The thing is, I don't write things for the challenge. Of course, when something's done, I like to see it. And once I start, it's sort of like a promise. For instance, if I said, we'll meet for coffee, we'd meet for coffee. It's like that with form, and that's the way it is with this Sestina. Don't get me wrong, I love to play with form, and there's a certain pleasure in a challenge. Again, for instance, I've included coffee, a word that doesn't have a lot of promise. To say the least, for use in a Sestina. Once having used it, I'm obliged to see it. Though, okay, let's say I'm stuck with coffee. I need a spot to stick it. Then I see it, and bang, as right above, I've met that challenge. That's what you've got to do with a Sestina. You pounce on any opening with promise, and score your piddling points against the form. But having seized those openings with promise, and being well along in one Sestina, and every time it comes around to coffee, sneaking another by to beat the form, it's not just a grand achievement as I see it. Suppose you prove you're equal to the challenge. The point is, what's the point? Who's going to see it? As anything but diddling with a form. That's why I've never written a Sestina. It's always seemed a wholly senseless challenge. But I remember what you said at coffee, and also, since a promise is a promise. Even when it takes the form of a sestina, I'm hoping you may see it as a challenge to promise we will meet again for coffee. Excellent. Very good. <laughs> All right. Our next feedback comes from our episode 235, De-Extinction and Other Patron Questions. And the first feedback comes from the Lord of Byzantium on our Discord community, who writes, 
Regarding the spherified wine, it's worth telling the patron there's a much simpler pr permitted in the GRM, GIRM and with good standing in Christian tradition regarding receiving the precious blood without touching a chalice, and that is intinction. Another option is spoon and straw, although the USCCB says this isn't customary in the Latin diocese in America. It is followed in the GIRM. For the record, spoon and straw was the method which the precious blood was received in the West before it fell out of practice. Yeah, I'm familiar with those options, um, and I actually prefer receiving communion by intinction. Um, however, my and I, my memory could be mistaken on this, but I seem to remember this issue originally coming up in the question of uh, what would options be for uh, consecrating the, the Eucharist in a microgravity environment? Like if you're in a spaceship that doesn't have rotational gravity, you know, is there a way you could celebrate mass without the precious blood going everywhere? And one way would, uh, intinction really wouldn't do that for you, and neither would the typical uh, spoon or the typical spoon and straw method. You could have a kind of Eucharistic sippy cup, um, as indignified as that sounds, um, or you could have like a bulb with a straw that's sealable. Um, but the um, but that's really why the spherification question came up, if I recall correctly, and that's the question I was asked. So that's the question I answered was about spherified wine specifically. Central Scrutinizer, uh, also on our Discord, asks, what about frozen wine or wine slushies? I think that this is a spirit of the law, rule of the law kind of thing. Even if we could come up with a way, it's probably better that we don't. Yeah, I also wouldn't recommend, uh, I think frozen wine would cease to have the, I mean, if you've got a wine ice cube, it no longer has the appearances of potable or drinkable wine. And so there would be a very strong argument in that case that the real presence has ceased. And so, um, and if it was frozen wine to start out with before you consecrate it, I think there's a good argument the consecration is going to be invalid. Um, when it comes to wine slushies that have frozen water ice in them but are not completely frozen, there's a, in addition to questions about would that be licit or in conformity with the law, um, there's also a potential validity issue in that the church um, mandates certain levels of alcohol content. And if you're freezing the water out of the wine, it's going to raise the alcohol content proportionally of the wine. And hypothetically, that could trigger issues regarding uh, validity of consecration. That's good to know. Our next feedback comes from Onique on our Discord, who writes, That new chatbot is something. Look what a good song it wrote about Jimmy. And this is the chatbot AI, uh, ch uh, chatbot G GPT AI. And so here's the song it writes. Uh, verse one with choruses and a bridge. <laughs> so here it goes. Uh, a man of faith and wisdom, Jimmy Aiken, a Catholic champion. With his knowledge and insight, he guides us through the mysteries of the church. Then the chorus, Jimmy Aiken, Jimmy Aiken, a voice of reason and truth. His words inspire and educate, a shining light in the world of Catholicism. Verse 2, from his blog to his podcast, his writings and teachings, he shares his thoughts, shares his insights on the faith. Uh, and it's a little obscured there, but uh, there's something in the... Uh, the way it was copied. No, that I, 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 think, I, I think that's just, he shares his insights on the faith. I think that's oh, all it says. Okay. Then back to the chorus, Jimmy Aiken, Jimmy Aiken, a voice of reason and truth. His words inspire and educate a shining light in the world of Catholicism. Then to the bridge with his passion for apologetics and his commitment to the church, Jimmy Aiken, a voice of clarity in a world of confusion and doubt. Jimmy Aiken, Jimmy Aiken, a voice of reason and truth. His words inspire and educate a shining light in the world of Catholicism. Okay, so I mean, I mean, I'm impressed by the fact the chatbot was able to do something, you know, coherent. That apparently it's 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 drawing on you know what's out there about me on the web, and 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 it's just a little uncomfortable to have something like that <laughs> written about you. But 
Now it's your turn, Dom. Yes, and yes. And so I will read your song. <laughs> okay. A man of faith and humor, Dom Bettinelli, a Catholic treasure. With his wit and charm, he brings laughter and joy to all who listen. Dom Bettinelli, Dom Bettinelli, a voice of joy and laughter. His words inspire and uplift, a shining light in the world of Catholicism. From his podcasts to his blog, his writings and teachings, he shares his insights on the faith. This is sounding a little familiar, isn't it? His writings and teachings, he shares insights on the faith that he loves. Dom Bettinelli, Dom Bettinelli, a voice of joy and laughter. His words inspire and uplift, a shining light in the world of Catholicism. With his love for the church and his commitment to sharing the gospel, Dom Bettinelli, a voice of hope in a world of darkness and despair. Dom Bettinelli, Dom Bettinelli, a voice of joy and laughter. His words inspire and uplift, a shining light in the world of Catholicism. I will have my children and wife sing that to me every morning as we <laughs> <laughs> It seems to me that that um that it borrowed a, basically a lot of the structure and changed a few of the adjectives. Yes, yes. And I I I can guess where it's getting some of this like on my blog mm -hmm. that it there's I put it I think in the header something about uh faith and humor and whatever. Mm. Uh so yeah, that's <laughs> but it's fun, it's fun. It's Cuz there's a third one now uh, about the podcast itself and he asked uh, to write a song about the podcast Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and here it is. In Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World where secrets and legends unfurl, he'll take you on a journey to places you've never been before. Jimmy Akins, Jimmy Akins, he'll take you to the edge and back through the mysteries of time and space in Jimmy Akins mysterious world. From ancient ruins to UFO sightings, he'll explore it all with fascination. With his curiosity and wit, he'll leave you in a world full of wonder. Jimmy Akins, Jimmy Akins, he'll take you to the edge and back through the mysteries of time and space in Jimmy Akins mysterious world. With his keen mind and open heart, he'll delve into the unknown, uncovering the mysteries that have puzzled us for so long. Jimmy Akins, Jimmy Akins, he'll take you to the edge and back through the mysteries of time and space in Jimmy Akins' mysterious world. Okay, <laughs> now, um, so here we just have the lyrics, but there's a whole other dimension to things when you hear some when you hear lyrics set to music and it so happens that someone has actually written and recorded a a song about me um people will know that i'm a fan of mystery science theater 3000 and on mystery science theater 3000 one of the characters was named tom servo and he was voiced by an by an actor and artist named kevin murphy well, these days, Kevin Murphy is working with the Rift Tracks crew, which is a group of people who were formerly associated with Mystery Science 3000 back when it was still on the air. And they're still doing the same things of making jokes at movies and so forth. Well, a few years ago, they were having an event that they were raising um, funding for uh, via Patreon and or uh, some kind of crowdfunding thing. And I donated enough to the event that one of the benefits I got was Kevin Murphy, Tom Servo himself, wrote a jingle about me. And he, uh, he, a he asked some basic questions, you know, to find out more about me. And this is the official Jimmy Aiken jingle. He's the Robo-Catholic Out there fighting the good fight He's the Terminator Protecting the truth with all of his might He's a faith defender Every day except for the night When he's a square dance caller That is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. 
Yes. I was surprised when I heard it. <laughs> that is fantastic. I know we must have musicians out there in the Mysterious World audience, and I would love it. We would make you, I would give you a Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World shirt if you set that last song the, the about Mysterious World to music so we could have it as an official uh, additional theme song for Mysterious <laughs> World. So uh, if anyone wants to volunteer, let me know, and I will get you the, the uh, lyrics that you could set to music. <laughs> just just make sure you use my correct name, Jimmy Aiken, instead of Jimmy Akins. Yes, the chatbot got that a little bit wrong. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, and then we've obviously got more feedback. Let's move on. Uh, J.Oz uh, wrote on YouTube, I was a little disappointed that Dom didn't reread the Deja Vu question later in the episode. And then we have another bit of feedback, also from J.Oz on YouTube, who wrote, I was a little disappointed that Dom didn't reread the Deja Vu question later in the episode. Wait. Well, I, I can understand that. I, well, I can understand that. That sounds vaguely familiar. All right. And then uh, Mitch Godfrey writes on... Uh, or Godfrey. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Godfrey. I apologize. Mitch Godfrey writes on Patreon, Is it permissible to believe that God used the genetic material of St. Joseph for the male genetic material in Jesus? He did this miraculously and did not affect the Blessed Mother's virginity. I like this thought to reflect an an even deeper connection between Jesus and his earthly father. So in terms of is it permissible, the answer would be yes, because the Church does not have a teaching on where uh, the genetic matter of Jesus came from, other than the fact he's Mary's son. And so, since we now know that you need uh, typically two sets of chromosomes, one of which is ma- has a, ma- a male Y chromosome, in order to give birth to a male, God at least needed to come up with a Y chromosome and possibly a whole complete set of of chromosomes that would have otherwise been inherited from a human father if Jesus had one. The Church has no teaching on where that where that genetic matter came from it could be that god just wrote the code himself and then created those those chromosomes ex nihilo and that's what was used in the conception of jesus um it's also hypothetically possible that he you know based it based that genetic code on a human source like saint joseph but um I think one of the church teachings is that Joseph is not Jesus's human father. You know, it's infallible. Jesus did not have a human father. And if God did uh, use either a cell from St. Joseph to get this matter, or if he just copied the information from St. Joseph's genetic code to create... um, ex nihilo, the set of chromosomes that was needed, it would um, obscure the fact that Jesus has no human father and therefore he's truly the Son of God. So I would think God would not do that because it would obscure that fact. And um, I mean, no one in the ancient world would have known because they didn't know about genetics, but we do today. And if Jesus had genetic matter from both Joseph and Mary, at least to a modern audience and future audiences that know about genetics, it would raise the issue of, wait a minute, how, was this really a virgin birth, or did they just get together uh, before um, before they were married and conceived Jesus naturally? So it would tend to undo or cast doubt on the virgin birth. All right. Then our next grouping of feedback comes from episodes 236 and 237 on the Loch Ness Monster. And our first feedback is an audio feedback from Giorgio. Hello, Jimmy. Hello, Dom. I'm Giorgio Fogarty. I'm nine and I come from Italy. I like your podcast. My favorite episode is 195, uh, Poltergeist. I really like the video podcast because uh, I understand better. English, you see, is not my first language. Today, I watch uh, episode 236 and 237 about the Loch Ness Monster. I agree with you. It would be uh, very cool if the monster were 
a pleasure, uh, but I think it might be a giant lake snake. A big hug from Italy. Ciao, Jimmy. Ciao, Dom. Thank you so much, uh, Giorgio. That's really great. I always love hearing from international listeners and from listeners who are young people. And so it's great to hear from someone who's both. Glad you enjoy the podcast. Um, you know, uh, your theories about what the Loch Ness Monster might be are very interesting. Um, also glad that you enjoyed episode 195 on poltergeists. And I just thought I'd let you know that we have another similar episode coming up, episode 260. So this will be coming out in a couple of months from now. Um, but episode 260 is called The 21st Century Poltergeist. And it's about a modern poltergeist that occurred here in the 20th century. The person that the case was centered on was actually an 11 year old boy. And he had uh, some amazing effects on electronic devices. So since you enjoyed our previous Poltergeist episode, uh, do keep an eye out for episode 260 on the 21st Century Poltergeist. And we'll be talking with the chief investigator in that case who will be telling us all about what happened. And uh, your English is phenomenal, Giorgio. So, excellent. Especially for someone so young. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So ciao, Giorgio. So our next feedback comes from Ben Polachek on Facebook, who writes, I never knew much about the Loch Ness Monster, so good show. I'm not sure it's real, but I do know that there are mysterious creatures out there, and different kinds of animals can somehow show up in surprising places. For example, near my in-law's farm in Iowa, there was a female moose that got lost and wandered quite far away from its usual range in northern Minnesota. Thus, you could theoretically have some sort of creature, even if it's just a whale or a seal out there. Yeah, and there have been uh, creatures like deer and seals that have been swimming in the loch, and I'm sure that some of them are the basis for some of the monster sightings. Um, if there is a monster itself, it, my guess would be it's most likely uh, a large a large eel or a colony of large eels. But um, but you know, it's it's still an open question. Matthew Dadamo writes on Facebook, an interesting aspect that should be touched on upon is why Aleister Crowley, the notorious Satanist slash occultist, lived on the property along the lock and what type of connection there might have been to the beast. Perhaps the creature is real, but not physical in the sense that people are looking for. Okay, so in that case, the beast would presumably what be what's known as a tulpa or thought form, which is a kind of entity that is believed in some circles, such as theosophical circles and in some Asian cultures, to be a kind of thought creation that um, may or may not take on a life of its own. Um, we will be talking about tulpas in future episodes. We will also be talking about Aleister Crowley in a future episode. Um, I would be skeptical, though, of uh, him being responsible for the monster. If he were, if it were some kind of, you know, non-physical entity that he created, it would then be a tulpa since he's no longer alive and it would have to have taken on a life of its own in order to still be here. But, um, you know, I, I just urge caution in this area because we really don't have good evidence that there is anything abnormal in Loch Ness. And there also is a tendency that people can have to, because we're so good at human as humans at finding connections between things. And it's like, oh, Aleister Crowley apparently lived here. There's a monster being reported here. Therefore, Aleister Crowley had something to do with it. Well, maybe, but you need evidence for that. And I have yet to see any evidence that Aleister Crowley even tried to come up with the Loch Ness Monster, much less that he had the ability to come up with a Loch Ness Monster or any success in coming up with a Loch Ness Monster. So just because there are these two things that are correlated in space does not mean that they're actually correlated in reality. We need evidence in order to propose such things, and at least thus far, I haven't seen any evidence. 
Next, Chad Bailey writes, absolutely wonderful pair of episodes. I'm a professional scientist and was pretty taken in by the first episode, but wow, you really hammered me into reality when I watched the second. Thanks for reminding me of how important it is to check your assumptions and desires at the door when looking at reality. Great show, Dom and Jimmy. Thank you so much, Chad, and uh, glad you enjoyed it, and always happy to have the opinion of a science professional. Uh, Jeff writes on Discord, when I saw the DNA study a few years ago, I sadly reconciled myself to the fact that there was nothing extraordinary in Loch Ness. Giant eels are not extraordinary. Perhaps if they were shrieking eels, it might be different. That would I be, so or rodents of unusual size. <laughs> exactly. Uh, anybody want a peanut? I was hoping Jimmy could pull a rabbit out of his hat and give me new hope, but it was not to be. I do find it a little ironic that all the skeptics who said that the surgeon's photo showed an otter or a seal were wrong. It shows the neck of an underwater creature, a fake neck to be sure. Thanks for killing off a little bit of my childhood, but seriously, thanks for a good look at the topic. Thank you so much, Jeff. And then uh, Do Shield on YouTube writes, even or yeah, Do Shield. Even though it is a bit of a disappointment, I'm satisfied after this episode because revealing hoaxes and solving mysteries is more appealing to me. I think it would be cool to see giant eels in Loch Ness because I also love seeing big fish. Thank you for sharing this wealth of information with us, Jimmy. Happy to do so. Uh, Joyce the Trucker on YouTube. Has anyone done similar DNA analysis of Lake Champlain looking for a champy? While not nearly as well known and not as often, there have been similar reports in both upstate New York and in Vermont of a Nessie-type monster in Lake Champlain. And there have also been reports of other lake monsters elsewhere. Uh, lake monsters are fairly common in terms of reporting, and we will be looking at other lake monsters in future episodes, but I wanted to do Loch Ness first because it's the most famous. Harry Andrew writes via email, Howdy, Dom and Jimmy. This is Harry from the Scottish Highlands. Thank you for your recent episodes on the Loch Ness Monster, affectionately known as Nessie. I live approximately 35 miles north of Loch Ness, and as a result, have always known of the elusive creature and have been to Loch Ness many a time. I appreciate Jimmy's attempt to use the Scottish CH sound. You did a grand job. I want to just make one small critique on the surname McKay that you pronounced as it appears, but it actually pronounced Mackay. Small, easily made mistake. Your research and analysis is spot on. I liked how you used the local newspapers as a major part of your sources. The fact is that there is no monster in the loch, unfortunately. However, around here, we always say there is a monster. I guess you could say the spirit of the fantastical creature is real. Anyone who sees the loch is immediately wowed by the beauty of it, as is the case of the entire highlands of Scotland. It is the most beautiful part of the world. The loch has a certain magnetism to it. It draws people to it. The monster is a huge part of the local economy, drawing in millions of pounds. As long as the legend of the monster lives, the monster is, in that sense, real and vital to the local economy. Thank you for the amazing work you do. These episodes were fantastic. If you ever need any assistance in the future with Scottish research or pronunciations, get in touch with me. I'd be more than delighted to help. We actually have our own version of the Yeti called the, oh, uh, this is Scottish pronunciations right there. You could help me with there, uh, Harry. Um, Am Fear Lath Moore, or the big gray man of Ben McDewey. McDewey or Dwee or something like that. Yeah, we, <laughs> we could use Scottish pronunciation help. <laughs> That's right. Uh, perhaps could be included in an episode about Yetis. And if you ever fancy a trip over to Scotland to see the loch for yourselves and maybe explore more of this stunning area, get in touch and I'll show you around. Well, um, thank you very much, Harry. It's great to hear from someone who lives near Loch Ness. I appreciate the pronunciation correction on the name Mackay. Um, you know, without local knowledge, I tend to go with standard, you know, spelling rules as a guide to pronunciation. But English spelling is very non-descriptive of how words are actually pronounced in many cases. Uh, so thank you very much. And at some point, I'd love to come over to Scotland and uh, look at the scenery. I've heard it's gorgeous. You also, if you ever come over to the U.S., I would suggest we have some really gorgeous scenery here, too. In particular, I would recommend to you and to anybody who can get there, because it's absolutely amazing, go to the Painted Desert 
in Arizona. It's near the Grand Canyon. It's near Meteor Crater. So there's a bunch of interesting stuff to see there. It's also near the Petrified Forest. In fact, the Painted Desert and the Petrified Forest are part of the same national park. And wow, the Painted Desert is gorgeous and it's unearthly. It's like you're on another planet. It looks so different, but it is so gorgeous. So anyone who can, I strongly recommend they check out the Painted Desert. And uh, I want to mention just that uh, Loch Ness is gorgeous. I follow this YouTube channel of this outdoorsman, uh, Simon Bloke in the Woods, and he did a recent multi-day trip uh, canoeing down the loch, uh, which, and it just, Gorgeous, fantastic. I did make sure to look for any little heads poking up in the water near him, but uh, I didn't see any. <laughs> All right, our next feedback comes from Brett Adams via email. Dom and Jimmy, I completely understand how someone might see something in Loch Ness. When I studied abroad in undergrad, my then girlfriend, now wife, treated me to go see it for my birthday, along with Stonehenge and a few other mysterious places like that. I never believed in a Loch Ness monster as understood as an ancient dinosaur or something similar, but when we went out on the boat and the waves got bigger and bigger, much different than many lakes I'm used to, with the darkness of the water, the chill in the air, and the scenery, I completely understood how someone's imagination would start getting wound up and they might mistake something innocent for something like a monster. I'm sure a lot of these sightings are hoaxes, but I also now believe a lot of them might be very innocent, as y'all identified. Well, I'm glad that you found it useful, Brett, and it is something that always has to be uh, taken into account, either hoax or misidentification or something like that. And both of those, both hoaxes and innocent misidentifications, are quite real in many situations. Our next feedback comes from episode 236A, which was a mysterious feedback episode, and Cameron Byers commented on YouTube, Regarding your comment on the Book of Tobit, does that mean that the characters within the story are not real? That we shouldn't invoke the inter intercession of St. Raphael? Well, um, so the we have good evidence that the Book of Tobit is not meant to be a literal historical narrative. That's something that is evident to careful scholars of the book. The, the author of Tobit is deliberately sending cues to the audience to tell them this is not a literal narrative. Um, that's widely recognized in the scholarly community, even Protestant scholars who don't consider the book canonical, and they don't look at those evidences and those cues and say, ah, these are evidences, it's all fake, it's inaccurate. No, the competent Protestant scholars will say, here the author is telegraphing to the audience that this is not a literal historical narrative. And John Paul II, you know, confirmed that in his discussion of the Book of Tobit. But just because a narrative um, is non-literal, that doesn't mean it can't involve real people. Um, you could have, in fact, there are, there's all kinds of, you know, fiction that's historical fiction that involves real people. You know, if you read a historical novel from that's about the time of the Civil War, I mean, maybe, I don't know, Gone with the Wind or something, they're going to mention real historical individuals. They're going to mention Abraham Lincoln. They're going to mention Robert E. Lee. They're going to mention real people who may even appear as characters in the story, even though the overall work is one of fiction. Um, and we have evidence from outside of Tobit for Raphael. Um, Raphael, like Gabriel and Michael and Uriel, is mentioned in multiple works of Second Temple literature. So Raphael was one of this group of named angels who were popularly believed in at the time and get mentioned in various other works. Like he's mentioned, for example, along with Gabriel and Michael and Uriel and some others, in um, First Enoch and, and um, other works of Second Temple literature. So he could well be an angel that is real and revealed himself to humanity at various points and then got a reputation, and people started using him in this literature, including the Book of Tobit. So, um, so I wouldn't assume that Raphael is not real. Furthermore, suppose he's not. You know, well, what happens at a company when um, when someone 
thinks somebody works there and they send an email to that person even though the person doesn't work at the company maybe he never worked there maybe he um maybe he used to work there maybe he did work there but died or maybe he's left and they send an email to this person so if you think john smith works at acme chemicals and you send an email to john smith at acme chemicals and there is no employee by that name um, what's going to happen? Well, someone's going to read it, and they're going to forward it to the needed person, and then that person will take care of it. Um, you know, I we have things like this at Catholic Answers all the time, where someone will not be sure of what address to send something to, and our webmaster will read it and forward it to me. Um, so someone in heaven, <clears throat> if there is no literal Saint Raphael, and I don't, like I said, I don't see a reason to suppose there's not, but if there weren't, God still knows you're praying for him, is asking for prayers, and he knows he cares about you and he loves you, and he'll make sure that your prayer gets handled one way or another, even if it's by someone else who has an interest in healing, because that's what Raphael has an interest in. His name means God heals. And so if someone's praying to St. Raphael, even if it turned out there was no St. Raphael literally, that prayer would just get routed and it would it would be taken care of anyway because God knows everything and he loves us all. So I wouldn't have any worries about invoking St. Raphael. All right, our next feedback is from episode 238, Christmas Weird Questions. And us Helen R. on YouTube writes, on the question of lying to children about Santa Claus. Spoilers. When my children, both now in their 50s, came home from school upset because another child told them there was no Santa Claus, I told them that Santa Claus means St. Nicholas, and saints, saints are spirits. Resurrection of bodies has not yet occurred. Santa Claus is the spirit of Christmas. That in that spirit, parents sacrificed to save money to buy gifts for their children. They readily accepted this explanation, and to this day, if, they, if asked if they believe in Santa, without hesitation, they reply with a resounding yes. I think that's a creative way to deal with childhood disappointment. It is a, um, it, there's a kind of elegance to that. And, you know, they say, whatever gets you through the night. So whatever you get your kids through the Christmas season. <laughs> Our next feedback comes from episode 238A, which was a bonus episode on the meaning of the book of Revelation. And Rob Leonardi, our feedback coordinator who's submitting his own feedback, writes, It is awesome to see a bonus episode inclusive of another great Catholic podcast. I would like to know Jimmy's thoughts on some people's theology of the book of Revelation, with it heavily being the sacrifice of the Mass. I've heard many things from Jimmy on Revelation, but I haven't really heard anything regarding the Mass. Well, um, that's because I don't really, I have, I, I have, I haven't really seen any good evidence that the Book of Revelation is correlated with the Mass. There are clearly liturgical elements in the Book of Revelation. You know, you have the, um, you have the seven trumpets, and trumpets were used in liturgical celebrations. You know, they had the shofar. Uh, a ram's horn trumpet that they would blow in for uh, the Feast of Trumpets. Um, they also, the elements, uh, the angels in the book of Revelation with the seven last plagues are holding these special vials or bowls that are liturgical nature and are poured out, like what you would have in pouring out um, of liquids, libations, and blood, and things like that in the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, you also have God's altar featured in the book of Revelation. So there are heavy elements of liturgy that are being drawn upon in the book, but they aren't really that suggestive of the Mass. Um, I mean, number one, we don't know a whole lot about how the Mass was celebrated in the first century. The modern rites had not yet developed, and you know we know it, we know it was celebrated. It used bread and wine. The bread and wine become Jesus's body and blood. We have several different versions of the words of institution. Um, but really, the liturgical imagery that is found in the Book of Revelation is much more suggestive of Jewish temple liturgy rather than Christian masses. 
And so I have, I just have not seen a strong case made. Now, you could say, well, you haven't read enough. And maybe that's true. Maybe someday I'll read an account of this and say, oh, I never noticed all this stuff. And wow, there's a lot more here about the Mass than I thought. This really is heavily about the Mass. But I've read the book of Revelation many times. It's one of my favorite books in the New Testament. I've studied it very closely. And I just don't see a lot of mass references in it. I see a lot of Jewish temple references in it, but I don't see a lot of Christian mass references. Now, that's not to say that there aren't. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, Jesus is present in it. He appears as the Lamb of God. And so I'm, I'm sure that one can find some elements that correspond to the Mass. But when I hear claims like the Mass, is, the Revelation is all about the Mass, I just think that's grossly exaggerated. That does not correspond to the data in the book. The Mass, I mean, the, the opening of the book alone tells you this is a revelation that God gave to his servants to show them what must soon take place, not this is a book that God gave to show his servants the Mass. So this is a book of prophecy. It may have some elements reflecting the Mass in it, but I don't see the Mass as being a prominent part of what it's about. All right, and then our next grouping of feedback comes from episode 238B, Alone Together for Christmas 2022, which was Jimmy's live stream uh, episode that he did on Christmas Day. First feedback comes from Jane Boyer on Facebook, who asks, why that phrase, alone together? That was the Orwellian term used by the tyrannical government during their virus threat. Was it? Um, I wasn't aware of that. I used the phrase alone together for Christmas because it's it, it contains an element of humor, and I wanted to signal to the audience that this is uh, for you if you don't have anyone to be with in Christmas. Now, everyone was welcome, but I specifically wanted to do this for people who didn't have anybody to be with on Christmas, and so that's why I used that phrase. All right. The next feedback comes from G. McFly on Discord, who writes, In light of Jimmy's Christmas comments on the Shroud of Turin, I'd be interested to know if he's got a similar opinion, rather lack thereof, about the authenticity of the Guadalupe Tilma, or if he's more settled one way or the other by the evidence. The question of whether it bears a miraculous supernatural image or possibly something with a more natural explanation might be a very similar conversation to that which I see about the Shroud, involving the opinions and analysis of fabric and forensics experts and trying to track and verify custody over a span of centuries. But I don't see it up for debate nearly as much as the Shroud. I get the sense that experts are generally more willing to stake their reputations to the authenticity of the Tilma. So um, I should clarify, I don't have an opinion on the, um, on the verticality of the Shroud. Um, I ha there's a massive amount of research that I would need to do to arrive at a firm opinion. So I, I just don't have an opinion because the, the data is too massive, and I'm not going to adopt a position. I would love it to be real, but I'm not going to adopt a position just because I would love the position. Uh, I want to be led by evidence and not by personal preferences. And I want to use critical thinking to test all sides of a claim, not just the side of the claim that I would be skeptical of. I want to test all of the arguments. And so um, I'm not going to just run with arguments made by some people and say, oh, there are no counter arguments that need to be looked at. Because in the research I have done on this question, there are some counter arguments that I don't see get addressed by Shroud supporters, and so I need to do a much larger research project in order to sort that out, and maybe at some point I'll have the liberty to do that. When it comes to the Tilma of Guadalupe, I have also done some research into that, and some people are not going to like this, but the evidence seems to suggest that the image is a natural one, um, that it's a painting, and we even have some information about who it was that painted it. Now, that doesn't mean that the story of Juan Diego is false or that miracles didn't happen in connection with it. 
Um, but there is evidence that um, would suggest the uh, Tilma of Guadalupe is a devotional painting that was done to honor Our Lady of Guadalupe, um, who did appear to Juan Diego, but in the course of uh, historical transmission, the idea that it's not just a devotional image of Our Lady of Guadalupe, but that it's a miraculous devotional image got introduced into the narrative. But if you look at earlier sources, they talk about it as a painting and they even name the artist who produced it. So um, I still need to look in more into that. Uh, you know, some people are going to say things like, oh, but there are these miraculous images in the eyes of if you blow them up really big. Well, if you blow them up really big, to me, they look like blobs. You know, I don't really see, I think there's a significant chance of pareidolia or seeing patterns that aren't actually meaningful as if they are meaningful. Um, and I think there's a significant risk of that happening when people do gigantic blow-ups of the eyes of the Virgin Mary from the, from the Tilma. Um, but even if they were, even if, oh yeah, you blow up the, you blow up the eyes and, and it shows an image of Juan Diego and the bishop, well, maybe, maybe that was put in by the artist deliberately, or maybe God was providentially in control of the artist brush, and even if the artist didn't deliberately put that in, God arranged for that. But that's different than saying the whole painting just miraculously appeared out of nowhere and there was no human artist. So um, I hate to disappoint people, but it's kind of like the spiral staircase. When you look into it, there is significant evidence for a natural explanation, but that doesn't mean it's not meaningful or that the overall story of Our Lady of Guadalupe isn't true or, I mean, it, it converted a nation. And so, um, you know, I think the hand of God was definitely in this. Our next feedback comes from Tony L. on YouTube, who writes, I wish I could have participated, but I'm a family man, so I was definitely not alone for Christmas. Please consider another Q&A stream on a non-holiday. I know you have in the past. Yeah, I, I'll definitely consider it. I, um, I, I have so much fun doing that uh, Christmas live stream that I always think to myself, I should do this again soon, and then I get busy. And end up not doing it again soon. But I do sometimes do live streams, um, and I'll, I'll think about, you know, opportunities to do them. Dan writes via email, on your Alone Together for Christmas episode, around the two-hour 40 mark, you answered a question as to whether or not God would be hurt or angry if no one came to worship him. You answered that God doesn't need our worship, and he cannot be hurt in the sense that we can be hurt. But can't he now be hurt as he has incarnated? Is, he, is his resurrected self safe from the throes of emotion? During his earthly life, he wept for Jerusalem and felt gut-wrenching compassion for the people who were like a sheep without a shepherd. Is he now insulated from feeling anything? I've heard stories from private revelations, ones which the church honors and celebrates, like St. Faustina's diary, where Jesus speaks of how much it hurts him when a chosen soul does not trust him. If he cannot feel emotions nor be hurt, then did this apparition lie, I say rhetorically, or only speak in a way to ev evoke an emotional response from his creature? I've also heard others say that God can't be hurt as we are hurt, but doesn't that deny Christ's humanity? Is this idea merely a theological opinion versus reality? Well, um, it is a theological opinion, but I think it corresponds to reality. Um, so Jesus is, by taking on human nature, Jesus did take on vulnerability. He could and was hurt in his human nature, and that includes both emotional and physical forms of pain. But now Jesus is in the glory of heaven. He's in a glorified state, and suffering is inconsistent with that state, which is why we're not going to suffer when we're in the glory of heaven. So I don't think appealing to Jesus' humanity is a way of supporting the idea that there is active suffering in, in heaven and in God today. When it comes to revelations like St. Faustina, or, you know, saying my, or other private apparitions saying, my son is angry, or my son is hurting, or Jesus weeps when this happens, um, I think that language is accommodated to our non-glorified state. It shows what would be felt 
by Jesus if he were in a non-glorified state. And that teaches us it and makes real for us the um, the nature of our reactions. You know, if we know he would be hurt by this if he was non-glorified, or he would be angry if he was non-glorified, or he would be sad if he were non-glorified, that helps effectively communicate to us, you better need to change your behavior, you know, because uh, because there is something, even if it's not pain as we experience it, God recognizes the character of our act, and so there is something in God that recognizes this act is such that it would warrant anger or sadness or something like that. And so there, it, the, this, this is not lying. It's just representing a truth about God and what God recognizes in a way that helps us in our non-glorified state to understand it. Because there is a reality in God that says, yeah, that thing is worthy of, of a lot of anger, so you better knock it out. And that just gets described as God is very angry about this, so knock it out. Um, Christ in a non-glorified state could be hurt, but um, this is true. This is not true of his glorified humanity. It's also not true of his divinity. That can't be hurt at all. And therefore, it's not true of the other two persons of the Godhead. So you can't literally hurt the Father and the Holy Spirit. And even though you can say, well, what about Jesus' human nature? Okay, that's not really what people have in mind when they say you can't literally hurt God. It's like people say you can't literally kill God. They're not thinking about the incarnate Son of Christ. Yes, you can kill God once he becomes incarnate, but if you say God is invulnerable, you you know, you, it's okay to just go with that. You don't have to add an asterisk every time for the incarnation, which applies to only one person of the Trinity and only part of him, his human nature, as opposed to his divine nature. Our next feedback comes from Nan Nunca via email, who writes... A name isn't just a word or sound. The church forbids use of certain unchristian names for people in baptism. There was a priest on EWTN that said a child named Lucifer should wait until later for baptism because the church takes names very seriously. Well, I don't know who this was or what he was uh, exactly what he said, you know, so I can't comment directly on that. Um, I think it would be misleading to say the church takes names very seriously. Um, it takes them with a certain degree of seriousness, but um, it doesn't attribute magical significance to them, which is what people often sometimes imagine. Um, so just to be clear, what canon law says, and you can read this if you look at canon 855, it says, parents, sponsors, and the pastor are to take care that a name foreign to Christian sensibility is not given. So that leaves it actually quite broad. You know, you can have made-up names, you can have non-traditional names, you can have all kinds of names, as long as it's not foreign to Christian sensibility. Now, because in English, Lucifer is a name associated with the devil, yeah, that's kind of foreign to Christian sensibility. Um, I don't know that waiting on baptism is uh, advised, because the child might be in danger of dying and need to be baptized right now. But um, And priests sometimes go outside of what the law says and says, let's wait on this, which I think is a real risk, because the parents may get alienated by that and say, oh, well, then we're just going to quit. We're never going to have our kid baptized in this church. Um, so I am very... I'm, I'm skeptical of priests doing the praetor legem outside of the law delay baptism move. Um, I would just say, you know, um, <clears throat> that name is going to cause a lot of problems for your child down the line, and it's foreign to Christian sensibility. Why don't we pick something else? 
Um, but, uh, you know, it's notice it's sensibility that is what the church is focused on here. They don't want people picking scandalizing names for their children. That's different than saying the name has some kind of intrinsic bad meaning. It's the sensibilities of people, how people are going to react to the name that is the major issue here. Um, it is not that the sound has this some kind of magical intrinsic meaning that is ineradicable. Um, in other languages, a name may be perfectly acceptable. It may be perfectly acceptable to Christians in that other language. It just doesn't have the same meaning. So sounds, including names, are intrinsically meaningless. They only have the meaning that we give them. And consequently, there is considerable flexibility here. We don't want to scandalize people. We don't want to cause problems for a child by giving it a certain name um, that is going to cause problems for it later on in life. But um, but it's not that the name, it, the sound of the name itself means something. That all meaning that sounds have is attributed to them by us as part of the language process. It's not native to the sound. And so we shouldn't think that... Um, that sounds have magical natures. Also, I would point out that um, if you if you study history, it's clear that there are pagan names that end up in Christian circles, uh, including the names of pagan deities. I mean, one of uh, the members of St. Paul's broader circle was the evangelist Apollos. Well, guess what? He's named after the god Apollo. And so you've got a major pagan god as the name of a Christian evangelist. Also, in, between 259 and 268, the pope of, of the Church of Rome, the pope of the Catholic Church, was Pope St. Dionysius. Dionysius being another pagan, major pagan divinity. His alternate name was Bacchus. But he was the god of wine, and Apollo was the god of the sun. So you can have Christian evangelists and popes named after pagan deities. I've met someone, he wasn't, I gathered, he wasn't baptized as a baby, but he is a Catholic, and his name is Krishna, which is a Hindu deity. So we don't want to be overly scrupulous in this area. I understand that, yeah, Christian sensibilities are important, but we don't want to attribute too much significance to names. All right. Our next feedback comes from episode 239, the New Year's Weird Questions. And our first feedback is audio feedback from Kate. Hi, Jimmy and Dom. This is Kate in Colorado. I have a uh, some feedback on your episode of answering weird questions for New Year's Day and the extremely important matter of Steve Rogers and his time travel and the marriage to Peggy. I run a little homeschool group where we watch all the Marvel movies, and this has come up in our group with my high school kids, so it is of particular interest to me. I just wanted to let you know that I did a little research after listening to your episode, and it is implied that Peggy married a particular man that Steve had saved from Hydra, but it was never confirmed. And after Endgame, there's some theory that all along Steve was the actual husband and the father of Peggy's two children that they talk about in Winter Soldier. And I looked into it, and actually the screenwriters of Endgame have confirmed that indeed Steve was the husband and father to the children all along. So I thought that was interesting, and um, it isn't super consistent with the um, – the way they talk about the multiverse, I think, throughout the uh, Marvel Universe. But, you know, the multiverse itself, the way it's done, the multi-universe certainly requires a heavy suspension of disbelief as it is. So uh, that's my feedback, and keep doing what you're doing. I love listening to your podcast. Thank you. And we have a second piece of feedback that bears on this same question. So, Dom, why don't you read that? 
Sure. Stormtide Skywise on Discord wrote, So something interesting about Cap. There is a theory going around that he actually didn't replace anyone, and he was always the one who married Peggy. We never actually learn about Peggy's husband, and even when she's married in a flashback, she has a picture of Cap, not someone else. Also, old Cap being at the end of the endgame implies that he was always in the timeline. So I want to thank uh, Kate and Stormtide Skywise for their input. Uh, they have me at a bit at a bit of a disadvantage because I haven't seen a lot of Marvel movies. And someone, you know, I, I do get questions about Marvel movies and their faith implications. Um, but I always feel um, like I'm a bit out of my depth because I haven't seen a lot of them. And so I just do my best to answer the question as posed. And so the question that I was given was about, it was based on the assumption that she had originally married this other guy in the timeline, which there seems to be some evidence that it was implied, and as Kate says, but not confirmed. Um, and then after Endgame, there's this other suggestion that seems to have been confirmed by the writers that it was always Steve Rogers that she was married to. And the evidence that Stormtide Skywise points to also goes along with that. So um, thank you for the additional information. Like I said, I haven't seen the movie. Uh, you could well be right. It could, and I assume you are. Um, one additional possibility is that what we're dealing with here is a retcon. Uh, retcon is a term of art in the comics community. It stands for retroactive continuity. And the idea of a retcon is you're going back and changing something that had previously been the status quo. So, for example, um, <clears throat> originally uh, Superman w w appeared as an adult. There was no Superboy. And then they retconned that when they started out started coming out with Superboy, The Adventures of Superman, when he was a boy. And then they lost the rights to Superboy, and or they were in jeopardy of losing the rights, and so they retconned again, and actually they also did this for other reasons too. They've done it more than once. And so then they retconned Superboy out of the DC universe, and then they put him back in again. And so whenever one of these changes in the official story happens, it's it's called a retcon, and it could be that the writers of previous movies had uh, intended to imply that Peggy was married to someone else, and then the writers of Endgame thought different, and they got this better idea, and so they retconned away the idea that she had been married to someone else. So that's possible also. And we have feedback from Stephen Rantanen on YouTube, who writes... I don't see any difference between Jimmy Akin's views on the origin of species as compared to those of atheist Richard Dawkins. Perhaps they also agree on the origin of life itself. Jimmy's views are quite disturbing, especially because he is a Catholic apologist. It seems that he hasn't put much thought into the matter. Design and purpose are profoundly evident throughout every living thing. Random mutations and natural selection cannot account for this, not even with the help of billions of years. Similarities between species can be accounted for by the designer. Just as Rembrandt's paintings can be attributed to him by their common features, so too can all forms of life be attributed to God who applied common features to his creations. Well, um, I would say that, um, you know, I respect your opinion, Stephen. I actually have given quite a lot of thought to this subject, and I continue to do so because I'm a science fan and a faith fan. And so I think constantly about how, the, how they interact with each other. Um, there can be a tendency when a, someone disagrees with a view that another person has to kind of get a little hyperbolic and and exaggerate things and you know you say i don't see any difference between jimmy aiken's views on the origin of species as compared to those of atheist richard dawkins to me that strikes me as hyperbole as as fairly clear exaggeration um because i can think of a really big difference between me and richard dawkins God exists and is in control of all processes in the universe, including evolution. So Richard Dawkins is not going to agree with my view on that. We have very different views about the origin of species. We m might agree that 
a process of development or evolution is involved in the origin of species, but we're going to radically disagree about what's ultimately responsible for that process and, and the fact that God is in control of it. Also, another big difference, and this is a consequence of the first big difference, but another big difference is since God exists, he can directly intervene in this process. And according to the teaching of the Catholic Church, he actually did and does continue to intervene because human souls are non-physical phenomena that have to be directly created by God. And so God is constantly intervening in the in biological processes to give new human beings souls. Richard Dawkins is never going to agree to that, much less is Richard Dawkins going to agree to the proposition that God may intervene in evolution because he doesn't believe there's a God. So I see big differences between uh, my views and those of Richard Dawkins. Um, and I think it creates a misimpression to say, oh, I don't see any disagreement between you and Richard Dawkins. Well, if you think for a minute, there are some pretty major disagreements, and I don't think it's accurate to dismiss my views as being identical to his, because they're not. Um, my views on evolutionary questions are basically the same as those of Pope St. John Paul II. And if you wouldn't dis Pope St. John Paul II, um, if you'd show him respect, then I would ask, you know, to be given similar consideration, not in terms of um, being a great pope, because I'm, I'm not, but um, just in terms of, okay, well, if these views are okay for John Paul II to have, then they're okay for Jimmy Aiken to entertain too. Um, I understand that feelings can get wrapped up in things like this, but we shouldn't let tribalism and jerks like Richard Dawkins scare us away from giving open-minded consideration to scientific evidence. All right. I think that is all of our feedback for this time, Jimmy. Is that correct? Um, so. We actually had one oh. earlier from uh, Veronica Clevidence on Facebook. Oh. Oh, right. I must have missed that. Uh, let me see if I can find her. There it is. Sorry about that. Um, I must have skipped it. Okay, so Veronica says, sorry, Veronica. Uh, Jimmy, this was great. This is with regard to Alone Together for Christmas. I got to say, though, I'm very, very disappointed that with all the X-Files episodes you mentioned, which are all wonderful, of course, you failed to mention how the ghosts stole Christmas. Every time I watch it, I scare my animals laughing. But you did make me smile remembering the episodes you mentioned and how much fun they were as well. Love that you're an X-file, file as in P-H-I-L-E. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, Veronica. I'm, I'm glad I brought you some happy memories. And thank you for reminding me of how the ghosts stole Christmas. That is a very funny episode, and, and it uh, is one I should have thought to think of when asked a favorite Christmas favorite episodes of the X-Files on Christmas, I should have thought of How the Ghosts Stole Christmas, because it is a very fun episode, and it's Christmas-themed. That's right. That's right. All right. Okay, so then I think we are we have our completed our feedback for this time. We would love to get your mysterious feedback on any of the topics we covered. You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Aikens Mysterious World Facebook page, sending us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com, sending a tweet to at mys underscore world in the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord, or by calling our mysterious feedback line at 619-738-4515. That's 619-738-4515. And I want to tell you also to make sure to check out the show on Jimmy's YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken, where you can see a video version of this episode and you can leave comments there as well. And be sure to hit subscribe. We're trying to get Jimmy's channel to 40,000 subscribers and, uh, you also make sure to hit the bell to get notifications when we post another episode of mysterious world or any of Jimmy's videos. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion on our show notes at mysterious.fm slash 250A. And remember to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. And until next time, Jimmy Aiken, 
Thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Tom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. <laughs>